tonight to have him come talk with us. You know, it's a pretty rare opportunity to get his perspective and insight into the, the making of the chapel of the fresco. So I'm not going to talk for you know, just more than a couple of minutes. I'm Cliff Strain, for those of you that don't know me, I don't know, we see a lot of familiar faces out there. And, uh, and if you're ever thinking about volunteering at the museum of Farley Homeworks, you have to get exposed to enough of our lectures and if you haven't been to the party book works or the meeting, I guess everybody says they got a glass of wine and went to the museum. <laughs> and you could have got one at the party book works on Saturday night, plus a, a plate of delicious spaghetti that David cooked for several days. So, uh, but we'll be doing another one of those on the second Saturday of next month. But we do have, uh, you know, we're always willing to train somebody, and one of the most exciting things is, is taking people to the to the chapel. And I wish. I could make a video of everybody's expression when they first walk into the chapel because they just got this look of amazement and they get so excited and, and, and I think that's the, the big take home pay for the, the chapel guests is, is, and because and uh, Frank uh, Morgan who used to be our president of the board, uh, we have several board members uh, with us tonight including our new president. Pete, would our, would our board members stand up for just a second so we know who they really are? And Ashley is our Chief Operating, operating Officer for Papa. So she was on And uh, anyway, it's a, it really is a, a great job. And, and, the, and the chapel is one of the true treasures of our island. And, and, uh, and we're so happy to share with it. Share it. And we're so glad that the Carters are so good about it. I just uh, walked up to uh, Frank one day and we, I said, and this, and the chapel was in beautiful condition. Uh, then I put a bunch of snakes in there. I think he had a rat snake and a python and something else, but it stunk. And there was like 12 or 15 coats of paint that peeled off in major sections. As many tubes of cough as Frank used on his house, it was a job he couldn't do. So I said, Frank, let me, let me paint the inside of the chapel. He said, knock yourself out. <laughs> <laughs> so I got in there with an electric drill and a real coarse uh, pad and just started sanding the whole thing down. It was, uh, it would get so smoky, you couldn't see the hand in front of your face. I don't know how much of that stuff I printed in. Yeah. But we finally got it down to the raw place. And in fresco, you, you have to have a substrate that's absorptive, that's uh, porous, and it was so sealed up from so many years that there was no way to uh, introduce any kind of plaster or anything like that. So I decided to uh, put rabbit skin glue over it. It's an organic substance and uh, made homemade gesso with titanium 
white and marble dust and rabbit skin blue and just just up the whole thing. And uh, I, I think it was quite a bit of blue and quite a bit of gesso, but has anybody been to Spain? Anybody been to Spain? You know, they make homemade gesso and they paint their houses. And it's really quite amazing. And back in 76, I took a tour of the uh, school I was going to, I went to run on the school design and I uh, went to Spain and bought a Vespa and traveled around Spain, but it's such a beautiful, pristine surface, you know, that reflects the light, and uh, if you've ever been there, you see those white little cottages that they paint, and they'll paint them every two or three years. So I painted inside of it, and then I did a bunch of big stars over the top. And every star was kind of unique, and, uh, and I left it like that. And then about three or four months later, I, uh, I, divide, I began to divide it up into points. So I would, I would make a section and then uh, re-gesso that whole section on top of the stars. There's some of the stars are still left. And then I went back to Austin where I was living in and did sketches for each of the parts each of the sections. And then came down and we just started redoing everything. Frank gave me a little room in his house and uh, and I would stay in that room and then we didn't say too much to one another but <laughs> Frank wasn't real communicative. But he he was a he was a force of nature. I wouldn't want to be on the bad side. <laughs> <laughs> so we got up there and I started translating all of these uh, sections into stories in the Bible. I just kind of went the chronological way. Uh, so I guess we ought to start talking about uh, what we've got here. And those are the stars, those, those are the ones on the left. That's the tree of life on the right. It's got 12 fruits on it. And the leaves are, you know, heal the nations. And then uh, Adam and Eve there, and creation of, of the earth, the moon, and the heavens. And then, of course, those sunflowers, you know, we still got them, right? Yeah. Those blue ones that come up and have that yellow thing. Yeah. Oh, boy, they're everywhere. But you know, they have a really nice powdery surface. I tried to get that just using spray paint and stencil. So I tried to make this thing as simple as I could. Uh, what's the next one there? I think I can go through that. Okay. Those. So I started out. We'll go back. So this was Eve. And then everybody. You know, Frank said, man, you gotta put a, you gotta put a wine cloth or something up there. <laughs> so I, I acquiesced, and yeah, no, that's what we're getting. These are kind of later editions of flowers that grew up around the chapel, and I added those later. These are the original flowers that I put in. And uh, there's Adam with his leaf, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a real broad style. It's uh, kind of slapdash. It's, uh, it's meant to be uh, real joyful, real happy, even though that's not exactly where I was. That was where I wanted to be. 
Cliff went, and there, there's this tree that we put in there, and, and it's just kind of a basic, kind of simple motif. There's one there. So, uh, this was this vision that Daniel had. I don't know if y'all have ever read that book. Uh, it's really a very difficult literature, but uh, it's, so here's Daniel, and he, I mean, he's like a bug, you know? And then there's this angel that oversees, and then there's this judgment uh, that tilts, and then there's these creatures that are kind of like world and spiritual powers in the heavens that are kind of difficult to defy, actually. You can see the kind of face of the man here. You see him? So there's all kinds of uh, creatures that are, you know, quasi-mythological, really, but stand for these powers. And at that time, uh, I was real cognizant of the things that were, say it, just kind of uh, influences that were revealed as bad. So you, you had to kind of deal with this bad stuff and it really helped me to put it out into the expression of a work and to read it in a book and to begin to uh, move it away. And so that's really what the chapel was about for me. It was a kind of a redemp redemptive thing. We got another slide there, you know? yeah. But the main emphasis for the chapel was this sense of innocence. Uh, and I wanted to convey that there was something that was pure. And I, uh, I believed that there was. So I put that lamb up there. Uh, there was this uh, famous saint uh, called John, and he made proclamation of, of the lamb of God. And I repeated what he said in the, in the Bible oh, on the altar. But this is the main, the main image of the chapel is this uh, figure of this innocent lamb. And I guess on the Old Testament side, so we'll, we'll go down the old side there. Uh, the old side began with Abraham and Isaac. And, you know, that's just the contrary thing to innocence is the killing of, of an innocent person, which was Isaac, his son. So uh, when, when Abraham made that decision, even though he, uh, I don't really think Abraham ever saw God. I know that Moses did, but uh, you know, can you imagine having to have to do that and not knowing, you know, what the consequences were going to be? So that is how we gauge this kind of faith in innocence. Is the uh, I mean, that's a very serious thing, man. So this. Angel comes and stops him. And uh, and says to him, you know, do not hurt a single hair of this child's head. So that's the beginning, you know, of not only the Christian religion, but the Muslim religion also. So the next one then. 
Do you want the one below it first? Let's see. Uh, we can go to the temple. Yeah. You want to go to the temple first? Yeah, we'll go to the temple. So they organized this religion around Abraham, and I guess everybody probably already knows that. So I just kind of laid it out in schematic form, and uh, that's just a symbol of the, of the Jewish race. And then there's their menorah that they that they use. And then above that then was the incarnation of Jesus with Mary. Oops. Sorry. It's all right. And I put some of my friends in there. That's Robert Bradshaw. <laughs> <laughs> But then I, I put, the, put the Pope in there with a skull cap, and I put this leprechaun in here. <laughs> the split, can you explain the split in the, the image? Because I know it's like down below. Down here? Yeah. So this is a, this little uh, cherub dude is unfailing the, the script, you know? Uh, and so here's the child, and this is Mary, which is, uh, which was Susie the Reader, to be honest with you. <laughs> so uh, this is the, the sort of end of the old part and the beginning of the new part. And, but there's Job down below, let's look at Job. Because he was at one time Moses. But it changed him. Yeah. I said, you know, you got Moses is not making any weight down here. We gotta have Job. Because you know Job went, went through some Seriously. fairly horrific stuff. Those are the things that fell on on, on his head uh, for no particular reason. Uh, and he just, and I, I mean, a lot of people come to, maybe they don't, I mean, people on Port Ranch maybe identify with him, okay? <laughs> I'm not sure, but uh, we're trying to find some kind of justification for some of this bad stuff. So, Joe, he, he did work it out, man. And uh, there's, there's still the commandments there left over from Moses who stood right here. And then this was the burning bush. And they, these were his people. And, uh, but then I changed it, so. <laughs> okay, Cliff. This is the top. This is really the original cosmic crown for the sculpture. Uh, and, you know, I think Betty Bundy found it in the dumpster one day. And somehow she got my telephone number. She said, Mr. Coffey, do you want to throw this away or do you want it? And, you know, I was flabbergasted, man. They had taken a chainsaw and cut it off the altar. Well, I put it up there, and, and they were going, it's going to fall and land on somebody. You know, like Job. <laughs> but, so I, I glued it down. I mean, it was going nowhere. And they couldn't get it off. So they took a chainsaw and literally sawed it off of the altar. And, and she found it in the dumpster. So I took it and we have it in our home now. We had always kind of hoped that uh, once Dave, when David died that we could set it back up there. It would be okay with Marlene, but that never happened. That's okay, you know. I mean, it was not part. <coughs> See, the, <coughs> the thing that was important about that sculpture was, <coughs> excuse me, 
that uh, it was real, real rough, real uh, primitive. Uh, just, I mean, the arms were cut off. It looked like a totem pole or something. So nobody really, thank you. Nobody really uh, liked it. And it was so contrary to all these pretty colors and everything. But the reality is that all that fluff, man, is nothing compared to the difficulty that that person went through. And so you're not really going to be able to receive that kind of beauty and that kind of sentiment and that kind of goodwill without contemplating the difficulties uh, that that person encountered. So to me, it was like I was real pissed off, you know. <laughs> but, you know, it's okay. Uh, an artist has an opportunity to do what they feel like they know they should do, and I did what I, what I wanted to do, and Frank let me do it, and I wish that every other thing I've tried to do went as well, because <laughs> it generally doesn't. But uh, that is, that's what's left over there in the cosmos. And um, there's no expectation that it'll ever return, but it could. Next one. So these are the disciples in the boat. <coughs> we we named the boat Lily today <laughs> because it had a paint loss right there. So we just we called it Lily and painted over it. And I don't know how that paint loss occurred. But we fixed it up. And you know, this is really a reference to uh, the early church painting in Texas. Uh, what, they, what they call the uh, painted churches. It's a really good program. I mean, maybe everybody's seen it. So, you know, it's not that it's not that the, this work is really unusual or something. I mean, people have been doing it. And so High Hill is one of those places. Has anybody been to High Hill? Yeah? So it's really worth seeing, you know? So that's kind of a reference. And then, of course, Corbin Christy Bay and 12 disciples in a boat, you know? But you can, there are real subtle things. I mean, people go into the chapel and they they're in there for five minutes and they go, wow, you know, what happened to this guy? But they don't take time to really look closely at some of those things. Because, you know, there's really a in the new angel up in there. I mean, it just looks like a symbol. But there are some real detailed things if you look at close and spend a little more time. That's, that's one fascinating thing about the angels is the closer you get to them, the more detail you see of their faces. And, and, and yeah. And, and there might be, like, Andre and I were touching up today, the, the side, the wall that got kind of messed up, Harvey or whatever. And, but you, you, can, you can make three marks on a face and, and actually convey a feeling. So the simplicity of the idea, the innocence of it, the difficulties, and the contrary way in which the sculpture uh, contended with the beauty around it, all were things that uh, kind of make this thing, hopefully make it special. We did some stained glass for it. I think some of those pieces are going to go back in. This one, uh, is there one of the altar? The altar, I could go back all the way to the beginning. 
Okay, so let, we'll just do the. So this was one of the main tenets of my having done the uh, the chapel was these words that John gave me and Terry. Uh, and, and when you are faced with some of these difficult powers or the spirit of the world or other kinds of deadly feelings, uh, there was this saying that said, when, you know, you, you've got to test those spirits. And, uh, and that was a thing that I really kind of held on to in the making of this thing. So that's the, that's the real scripture of how you can manage to uh, kind of get around those things. And then once you get around it, you gotta keep it up. <laughs> okay. That's just a close up so you can see. Yeah. That. You wanna talk about that prior to the prior? Yeah, everybody wants to talk. I don't know, they have a split. So that you can see the big crack. So I don't know what happened, but it, it came back together again, which was real nice. And then moving around on the New Testament side, then Jesus uh, calls his uh, his disciples. All these uh, Mars right here we, we've uh, repaired today. <laughs> as well as other things that have kind of needed some attention. There's some big cracks down here that we we sealed. And the windows look really good. Um, they did a good job on those windows. I think it was the full mansion people, right? It was. It was yeah. yeah. They did a good job. We're just still kind of hopeful to get the stained glass in, but we lost the stained glass. Is there one of the altar itself? Yeah, we, I don't know. I went back to the, to the first one. I'll just come back to it. No, so we don't have one that has the altar. Oh, the first one, yeah. So we did a stained glass right here uh, as a kind of uh, promotion thing with Marlene and them to want to get involved in doing stained glass for the whole thing. But a lot of people like to be able to see outside and walk around and see inside, so, you know, that's okay, but this particular window was kind of high up, so we did uh, the first stained glass thinking that we could get her to uh, uh, have us do the, the two big north and south windows, and then some, and then the, same, the girl that did, uh, the lady uh, did the other stained glass, which is Really, not a very professional job. It's, it's kind of a kind of a Michael's like uh, um, amateurish job, but it's all right. You know, I mean, did did David Carter do that? Maybe? I don't know. I think things so in the family over there, but it's slumping real bad, and I can't think of man. It's gonna fall out. We can do it. <laughs> that's what happened. It, it, it had a lot started losing support, yeah. and it's on the hot wall, so the, the the glass distorted as far as you know some places cracked, yeah. and it just wasn't flat anymore because you saw what that how bad that frame got. Yeah, yeah, that's what happened. Anyway, so on the other side we did the sleeping prophet, which was uh, which was dedicated to Frank. Because after John the Baptist, then there's there's no more prophets. So, you know, we put the prophets to sleep. <laughs> but I mean, it's uh, there's a lot of stuff that that all those old prophets did for their nation. You know, I mean, they were seers. They they knew. I mean. If we had been more attentive as a nation and had uh, figures that were able to uh, give us a clue about this COVID thing or 
or some or other kinds of major difficulties. But but the Jews really did have those kind of people. And I, I guess we're a new nation and we really haven't developed that skill very well. But what is more, we don't we don't have prophets like like back then. But so it's it's really kind of a new uh, it's kind of a new dialogue. So we're going around. There's a there's musicians up here. There's uh. <laughs> John, you did have one question over here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm just curious about uh, your reason, and you've spoken to it a little already. Uh, why you chose this kind of loose uh, style? Yeah. It's almost green like. Yeah, it is. It's really just like, a, you know, kind of childlike, really. Yeah. So, uh, now the chapel I've been working on since this time is very different. It's very realistic. It's an egg tempera. There's uh, 27 panels now. And we're trying to figure out a way to make a building to house them. It's, but the styles, you wouldn't think I was the same person, you know, if you saw, you know? And, and so, uh, this is the kind of the result of having gone to a school in Rhode Island. I had a teacher there named Dean Richardson. And man, I just, I had a lot of trouble at that school. Nobody really, uh, uh, they just didn't like me or something. But, <laughs> um, I did, I did kind of devolve into this modern work that was like very liberating to me because you know I'm always slavishly doing grasses or you know some landscape or some person's features and it, so it was really like a, a real break for me and uh, and I just wanted to say as joyfully as possible without having to uh, answer to any objective realism, you know. I didn't want I didn't want I didn't want to have to deal with reality for a period of time. Because it was so messed up <laughs> for me, you know. So that's, that was why I just, you know, just joyfully did whatever I wanted to do. Which was good, you know? Yeah. Now, uh, I heard that this was the first church on the, or chapel on the island, is that correct? That's not correct. So <clears throat> I know that uh, Frank said that that his mom built it because there was no other church on the island. And maybe he meant like a, you know, uh, 
his mom, Aline Carter, had a very non-denominational right, approach right. to things. You know, everybody was welcome in the chapel. Okay. And, but the Catholic church right around the corner, less than a block away from this building, was built. There's three accounts, but if you average them out, it was about 1910. Oh, okay. So, you know, quite a, quite a time before okay. this. But, but the chapel was before the Presbyterian church, which came three years later. And I'm not sure when the, the Baptist church came into play. And I always joke because my wife and I used to always say the first two buildings built in a Texas town is the Dairy Queen and the Baptist church. <laughs> and this, and this town is a little bit different. Yes. Well, I think that part of what John's talking about is that also this wasn't, like you said, it was non-denominational. And the island was a free, open place. And this is and open. It's not it's not the stations of the cross, the blood dripping down and stuff, you know. And I think that that's you know, that's that's refreshing. And that's the big charm of the chapel is that it's refreshing. One thing you mentioned about the snakes. The snakes were put in the chapel to run off the vandals that were starting to party and break glass and stuff in and that was Frank's, uh, you know, Frank's Strategy. vision. <laughs> yeah, Frank, it, you know, a lot of young men are into snakes and lizards and stuff, and he had pets. And those were pets that were put in the chapel to run off the vandalism. And it works. It works. <laughs> Okay, so the, the greens on St. Paul right here. Get the lights. Oh. Can we, can we turn the, the big lights back off? I'm sorry, what? Can we turn the big lights back off so they can see this one? Please? Yeah. You might have to explain to them. So this is uh, this is St. Paul <coughs> on the road to Tarsus, and uh, these these are people he was traveling on the road with, and he's struck by this light. So that's kind of uh, really crucial. I tried to pick really important parts of uh, what those peas are doing. <laughs> So, uh, this is Paul on the road to Damascus, who's struck down by the light. He becomes an apostle, uh, you know, after, after the event, the resurrection. Yeah, I didn't see that at first, because the green and the cloak had, had faded. But yeah, we, we replaced the green today. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, Peter and the institution of the church with the Gentiles. It's a defiance of the law, you know, uh, to allow the Gentile people to enter into communion with God. So that's, the, that's kind of an essential, uh, an essential thing. Yeah, there's there's snakes. Because it was it was uh, when he fell asleep on the rooftop, right? And right, right. God was trying to get him to. Yeah. You know, talk he was him. he was trying to get him to uh, kind of overcome that uh, that entrenched wall in their hearts, so that you know they could see again, so they could be real people without some kind of stricture all the time. And I guess uh, that's what Luke is saying about, you know, religion in general. It just, it's, it, instead of enlivening and enriching people's lives, it's like 
some kind of narrow thing that you kind of yeah, count out to, you know. Poor Reyes was never that way. <laughs> <laughs> so this last one is just, I got tired of telling stories, you know. This is just a seascape. <laughs> but one of, one of the things that's really cool right now is that the light that they have on outside that's shining on the western wall, and they have that uh, new wrought iron thing that replaces the bird that was there. So it casts this shadow, this big cross over the sky. Have you seen that? I don't think I have. Those yeah, you gotta go in there at night, and and it, and it's. And the light is shining through the, the iron, and it lands right here. Wow. So, that's the story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, Daisy uh, Guadalupe, uh, Deacon Guadalupe is up in Austin. He has this daughter, and they're really kind of very, like I was saying, kind of like, stuck in this real kind of righteous stuff. I mean, that's okay, you know, but I wanted, I wanted Daisy to be able to uh, maybe just experience in a way a kind of a, a kind of relaxing of that righteousness or whatever it is. I'm not sure what it is. So that, because in art, it's uh, it's like a real broad place, and, and it's meant to be that way. And so we, I, I, I know that all this talk and stuff about religion and everything is, you know, I don't know, some people, you know, it's kind of them or whatever, but uh, it's really, it's important to have the kind of openness in order to be creative, and to have some of the rules that John gave me to test the spirits that's, that are driving you and, and really expect for, uh, to be developed in trust and, uh, and love for everybody, regardless of religion. So, you know, art's a good thing. She, uh, so, uh, Gibbs, what's Gibbs? Mr. Gibbs, right? Gilbert. 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 <clears throat> yeah, so the famous story, you know, Gilbert. Everybody knows the story, right? No, no, no. Which one? Which one? Why this? So, Frank, it's Sunday afternoon, you know, a real nice day like today, and the Cowboys are playing. Mm -hmm. Oh, they lost, man. Sorry, Frank. <laughs> so Frank is watching the watching the game, and you know you just couldn't interrupt him during the game. So uh, Gilbert comes walking by with all his paint equipment, because you know at that time there was like a path next to Frank's house going to the chapel, and uh, he walked right by those double doors where Frank watches TV. And Frank's going, what's that guy doing then? But he kept watching the game and come halftime he said, well, I better go to check it out. So he got up there and Gilbert had prepped everything to paint the whole thing white again. And and so he, you know, I mean everybody knows when you're painting with a roller and you do the crevices first, so he'd done all the outside edges and he'd done all the niches and he was getting he he had to he had to pan out and he'd pour the paint. He was rolling the brush and trying to what are you doing, man? And Gilbert says, I've got you know, I'm called to turn this thing back white again. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we had to redo some of that stuff. <laughs> I don't know if Frank got in a fight with him or something. That's what I heard. He told me 
He had it washed off for good again. Yeah. And he, he did wash it off, but of course that's, it was still damaged. Yeah, man, I tried to send him a bill. <laughs> <laughs> I think you called in an iconoclast. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, that's true. That, that's the real meaning of that word. But the next one. Yeah. No, so that's the inside of the building, the houses of God, and that's a marriage ceremony. And uh, so I did little Daisy's pictures. Uh, that she had done of saints and people being married and stuff. So I wanted to include her in this thing. I know people don't want to see something that, you know, is not like different or something, but still, I just had to do that. Okay. So below her is the stoning of Stephen. Here is uh, Saul down here, who in the other picture is struck down by the light. He's giving his coat to somebody so he can throw stones at Stephen. It's a big snake here. We can't get rid of that guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Revelation wall. Uh, it's pretty complicated. There's angels here by the ten thousands and there's horsemen and there's uh, the eagle of uh, St. John and then there's the, the force of the power of the gospel with the human face. There's the ox. There's the lion. I think that's Matthew. Here's the angel of death. Uh, here's the Lord who has the keys and the stars of heaven. Uh, wow, it's real nice where that palm tree goes through there. Yeah. Yeah. You want me to show the lower parts? Yeah. Oops. So there's a. Uh, so these are. This is the wrath of God. Uh, they blow these trumpets and all this bad stuff happens. So. That's it. That's the last I know. Oh, wait, no, there's two more. Oh, okay. There's a. The okay, so one. this one really, we worked on this. Andre and I worked on this one today. We got it back in order. And the windows are all in place. Man, they look super secure. There's little vestiges of the, of the musicians. These are the dancers. And this is the choir. And, uh, we worked on that today. We got we got it back in order, I think. This one is the uh, passage of the people of Israel at night by a large flame and at day by a pillar of smoke. Uh, they're on their way to the promised land. That was very faded and hard to see. You know, that, that window was the one that really fell apart. No, I don't think so. I think it was the south side. That is the south side. It's on the Oh, is that? No, that's the north side. Oh, I think it was that way. That's Frank's house right there. Man. Yep, right. Now, this is the one that really had some water. Yeah, that was the bad Frank's. side. That's Jim Atwell right there. <laughs> he said he was coming, but he didn't show up, did he? I knew he was that agnostic. <laughs> I think that's it. Any questions? Yes? I may have missed it right in the beginning, but how did you come about this commission, and were you compensated for this commission? No. There was no payment. Talk about your relationship with Frank, but I, I, I must have missed how did you come upon this commission, this project? Uh, it's it's all relationship. Just he said, you know, why don't you do this? And you said, what knock the yourself way? out. Okay. <laughs> Those are his very words. I heard that. But, yeah, okay, but you heard that. I heard that. You were there. Right. Yes, sir. In the scheme of things, how long did it take 
You know, I, I had to retreat for a period of time, and then I would go back at it, and then I would say, oh, man, I can't do this. And then I would come back. So I think that was like three years or so. And is that original artwork still on display today? Well, we had a big show at Robbie Felder's gallery here, and we sold all the sketches. And uh, there's not even left. Hi, David. Were you religious before you did that? No, absolutely not. I was, I was a crummy guy. <laughs> It's kind of like a shirt, it's like, oh, okay. you gotta have some salt, you know? So, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, you know, I, I'm Cal-Tel, I'm a, I'm a Catholic. Yeah. And you don't learn all that Bible stuff then. Sorry? And you don't learn all that Old Testament and all that stuff. Oh, you do, yeah. In fact, I have scripture study uh, every day. Yes, ma'am. Is there anything being done to preserve any of the services, or is that not feasible? You know, we didn't get a chance to talk about uh, what we were supposed to talk about, and that was <laughs> uh, the way it's made and how it's preserved and what its method is. So this is this is not true. Fresco Center. Because, as I was saying, the walls were impervious. They were, they were not porous enough to accept it, the coat of plaster. And even if they were, I probably was not capable of doing it. So I, I glued everything and then gessoed it. And there's no varnish or any finish or anything. So because it's two shells, there's the outside shell, stucco shell, and the inside stucco, and then it's two before it's running through the center of it. And uh, Charles and I were saying there probably wasn't a lot, but because there's that space, the air has a tendency to preserve the surface of the inside layer of stucco. And what is more, the inside surface is still porous so that moisture, etc., can go through the gesso, through the organic compounds of the rabbit skin glue, and through the watercolor. And as a result, it's maintained, for the most part, its uh, integrity. But, I mean, we're working on it today. It's, it's got some issues, but none of them are really serious. I mean, we can fix it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, you know, considering my air conditioning doesn't last three years, how long do you think your, your artwork will last? Well, you know, there is a principle in paint uh, that makes it fugitive. In other words, there are so many photons that go through it for, you know, so many years. And finally, a certain number of those colors will become fugitive and disappear like the cream on St. Paul. But for the most part, uh, in true fresco, its, it's real value is in the fact that the pigments actually turn into stone. And when you go to Italy or any other place where you see true fresco, that is what has happened. And as a result, those photons aren't like going through it like they do in a porous surface like the one we have here. But it is definitely, uh, you know, almost all the colors have, to a certain degree, been reduced. But the intention from the beginning was to make it pale, make it light, to uh, keep it uh, in the tradition of the painted churches, 
And nothing is really, you know, just real bold. Did you it, it'll last a while. Did you have some things you want to Oh, I did. So here are examples, sorry, of true fresco. So we can just pass this around. Because we're trying to uh, do a fresco in Italy, of all places. And We've got the cartoon for it. We're, the family has agreed to it. You know, so these were three monks that lived kind of south of San Angelo in a Carmelite monastery. And uh, so that's a, a kind of lunette that is involved in the composition of this true fresco building. The uh, difficulty has been with the bureaucratic institutions in Italy. If you apply for a permit to uh, to do anything in a historical truck in a church, this, this chapel was built in 1560, and it's unadorned. So uh, we went over there, and various artists had different projects they were doing. So. I found this tile in the yard, and it was a it was a it was a game board that they had made when they roofed this building, whose original owners were cousins of the Medici. So I mean, it's you know it's a big deal. But I found this game board underneath one of the tiles that they used to tile. And I translated that game board into a large mandala to put up on the inside of this chapel. And everybody liked it, so we're going to try and uh, Here's another one. It's, it is so old, man, this method. It's really a cool method.
This is the uh, yeah. parade that we go on called the Olive, Olive Parade. And everybody, because they all grow, make olive oil. And then pictures and murals in Italy uh, actually had uh, paintings of hell. So this is one of those. I don't know if anybody wants that. <laughs> What we can do is after everybody, if in case it misses somebody, if you take them and put them on that back table, then people can take a second look at it or a first look. So you know, it's really good that the, the chapel doesn't just kind of like end here. It's really uh, you know you can take it further. You know, even back to the place where everything kind of began. What artists have done. Yeah, yeah like, where's that chapel that you're working at now? It's in Kisano. Kisano? Kisano is right in the middle of Tuscany. Okay. Yeah, it'll, uh, we're looking at 2023 now, but it's just been bumped down the road so many times. Yeah. Uh, but that, that Italian bureaucracy is just hell, you know, because you got to do this. And, then you got to do this. And at first they, they said, okay, well, let's don't tell them. <laughs> yeah. Which would have been the best strategy, but they received funding from the government for this agro turismo stuff because it's a working farm. And they said, oh man, if we get caught, then we can lose our funding. So we're going to go through the proper channels. And, and so now we're just completely uh, delayed. But it it's dear, better to do that. Is it near Marvieta? Uh, let's see. No, it's not. It's a, a half day's journey to Orvieta. Okay. It's it's fairly near a San Gimignano. Park San. One more. Looks like one more. Yes, I see. Yeah, that's for like. What are, you, what are you doing now? I mean, how is this, is this form to do work? Well, uh, actually, I'm doing a bunch of decorative art stuff. Tiles, uh, woodwork, cornice molding, plaster casts, a bunch of stuff for the, for the uh, placement of these egg temper paintings which is what I started after I finished this chapel. And I went up to St. Edwards, and Stan was one of my teachers there, and got in touch with the brothers. I mean, these guys, if I was looking for order, you know, these guys had it, and I was. So I learned a lot from them. This one? Yeah. 1933, right? 1937. 37. And, and there's a great picture of your sleeping prophet uh, on the it's on the Texas Highways magazine. You can go online. It was November of 2020. It's just a really beautiful color shot of that window. Yeah, it's worth seeing. It is worth seeing. And it will be back. They, t they said yeah. both those windows will get back. So hopefully soon. Well, Marlene has done a great job on that window restoration stuff. She really has. Yeah. Right. Any other questions? All right, well, let's give John a round of applause. Thank you. And also, yeah, uh, David said we've spent many hours trying to get the sound set up just so we don't have too much of an echo, and David's in responsible for that. <laughs> and Ashley uh, also did all the cutting up of the cheese and the serving of the wine. It was nice enough to bring it back over here in case you needed a second glass. 
She also brought with her the the, uh, the jars for donations. So if you missed them over there and you get a chance, you still have one more chance to do that here. And thank you all very much for coming and look forward to the rest of the lectures. After uh, February 7th, they're going to make us move out of here. I'm not sure we're going to go yet. It might be the Civic Center, uh, but just you know, we'll, we'll pay, post it online on Facebook and on our website when we figure out what else we need. But we'll be here through February 7th. Thank you. Thank you all again.